Joining us now is certified financial planner and founder of Life Coach Financial Strategies, Renee Rebola. Welcome back to What She Said. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Now, today we're talking about things to look for in our investment statements. What should we be looking for in our investment statements? Well, it's um, one of those things where people just get their statements, they kind of peruse it quickly and throw it in their files because they're not sure exactly what they're looking at. So they'll look at what the balance is and they'll be like, okay, I think that's more than the last time and then put it to the side. But they really do need to take more time and even a few minutes to just review the different pages. The statements are definitely governed by the government. So the government says what you want to see on your statement, which is kind of ironic. When when I speak to clients, that's not what they want to see. They have certain things they want to look at. So what I wanted to talk about today is some of the things that you need to look at so that you understand what's going on in your statements and not just throw it to the side because there's things that you may not know are there that are hidden in some of those lines. Okay, so where do we we start with the actual transactions? Yep, so first you would go through, so the first page shows you the balance from the last statement, maybe even year to date, and then today's date. So everybody looks at that. So I won't even cover that. But if you flip over your statement, typically on the second page is all the transactions that have gone through. So this is where your fees that you're paying are coming into play. So depending on who you're dealing with for your investments, different advisors get paid different ways. And there's no problem asking them how they get paid. You would ask a lawyer what they would charge by the hour. You would ask an accountant what they're going to charge you to do your tax return. Why would you not You ask your financial advisor or planner what they're going to charge you to give you service and advice? So when you look at your statement, you will see it'll show that a fee is done. So for example, I had a client who came into my office and she was being charged $20,000 a year on fees for services from her financial advisor, although she didn't feel that she had warranted those fees because she saw them once in two years. So sometimes the fees are justified based on the service that you're getting, but you need to look at your statement to double check because when someone tells you a percentage and then you actually see it in writing the gross amount, Sometimes it's not what you think it is. So that's very important. So, Renee, what would typically be the fees that you, what percentage is the normal range if somebody's just going to go and check now? Well, it's very unique depending on where you're located, right? So if you're in Toronto, you're going to pay a higher fee because there's more overhead for the planner. It depends on the service that you're getting from that person. If they're just investing your funds and they're trading, they're going to have a different percentage and able to discount themselves. If you're getting a planner who's actually providing you with a holistic whole look at your financial planning, then you could have a two types of fee segment. So it's a percentage and a monthly amount. So or us per service. So really knowing what you are comfortable with paying for against the value that you're receiving. On average, the industry is charging if you're looking at percentages. Mm-hmm. So if we're looking at an advisor to an advisor charging percentages, mm-hmm. on average, they're charging between 1% and 1.5% for their fees. Okay. And then there's investment fees. So there's so many different types of fees. Well, there are also trading fees. So if they sell a bunch of stock and buy a bunch of stock, then... It depends on yeah. the advisor again. Yeah. Some don't sell stocks. Some just do mutual funds and segregated funds. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So it all depends on the level of service that you need and the type of investment advisor that you hire. Okay. So knowing what you need is a big thing. So I always tell people, interview many people. Interview three and find out who you feel comfortable with and what resonates with what you need compared to what they can provide you. What would you say a minimum is for checking in with your advisor on what they're charging you and and for the performance of your funds? Yes, so you should be checking in with your advisor minimum once a year. And quite honestly, they should be checking in with you. So they should be touching base with you once a year to make sure that everything is good and that you're happy. Do you have any questions? If they're not at least reaching out to you once a year and you don't want to talk to them, I've had people come in and say, I don't want to call them. Oh, no. Well, that person's managing your money. How could you not want to talk to them? 
I have had the same situation with a girlfriend where I, she was afraid of her advisor. Yeah. I said, are you kidding? Like, How can you said, be? I'm afraid to call him and ask him because I think he's charging me too much and I'm not getting any returns. I said, are you insane? This is your money. And she had a lot of money. That's right. And you know what? This is the norm, sadly. And people need to understand that this is their money. This is their financial life. And that money affects their life going forward. So they need to take charge of it and say, hey, it's mine. I'm going to call you. I'm going to ask you the questions I want to ask. And if you're not going to answer them, and if you're not going to provide me the service, or if I'm going to be afraid of you, then I need to go interview maybe three other people and see who I do feel comfortable with. And then those people will transfer your money over to them without you having to do anything except for sign a piece of paper. So you can choose, which is the proper thing to do, to let your current advisor know that you're leaving them, or the new advisor can contact them for you on your behalf and do it for you. So, Renee, where can people go to get more information and advice? They can uh, definitely check me out on my website, so which you guys put on the screen, um, mylcfs.ca. They can contact my office. They can find me on Facebook, and I'm happy to answer any questions that they have, even by phone. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. Well, she said-